Across a country, the same things are happening. And in 2012, I got a call from a fellow UNC student who was younger than me. She reached out and said, I know you put these great policies in place, but nothing is really changing. The culture is still very much the same. What do we do about it? And I said, I don't know, but we need to do something. So being the nerdy students that we were, we went into research mode and tried to find out everything we could about sexual violence, sexism, and the intersections that play there. And what we discovered is that one in five women and one in 16 men will either graduate, transfer, drop out, or take their own life with the title of sexual assault survivor. Take that in for a second. What if one in five students' MacBooks were stolen? We'd be freaking out, right? But this is a felony that is committed, and yet it's one of the only crimes where the victim is consistently blamed. And what we also learned is that violence against women, of course it doesn't just happen in higher education and educational settings. It happens way before then, way after then. Children, the elderly, and everyone in between. This is a problem not isolated to the ivory tower, but the ivory tower gives a great microcosm of what the world is experiencing in some cases. We also learned that women of color, indigenous women, and particularly transgender women of color are much more likely to experience violence, but their experiences are not reported on because the media focuses on people who look like me. And so when we were learning all of this, another tool we came across, again, standing on shoulders of generations who came before, was a case called Alexander versus Yale. And this was in 1979, 1980, and five women at Yale Law School, one of them being Catherine McKinnon, McKinnon excuse me, said, we cannot learn. We do not have an equal access to our educational rights because we are being sexually harassed by our male peers and professors in the classroom. And when you think about Title IX, most people, especially prior to you know, 2011, would say sports. Title IX is about sports, and it is. It's about gender equity. It's a very short sentence. It says you cannot be discriminated against based on your sex, and now has been interpreted to mean gender as well, in any educational institution that receives federal funding, which is like 99% of them, even private schools that receive grants and loans. So we said, we have this vehicle. We're going to learn from them. And in 2013, we said, there's no way. If you are in violation of Title IX because people are getting sexually assaulted, what about when you have to sit in chemistry class next to your perpetrator? What about when you don't walk home from the library late at night? What about when your school says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do about your stalking situation? So after all this research, we found that there was an option. There was a tool called a federal complaint. And at 20-something, we didn't have any money, we could not afford a lawyer, and we found that any civilian, anywhere, if they felt like their civil rights were violated, can file a federal complaint with the US Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. And so we decided to do that. And in 2012, we were calling a few journalists saying, you know, we're, we're going to do this. And they laughed. Yeah, right, a group of young women are going to hold a 200-year-old institution, mind you, one of the best in the country, responsible for violating federal law. Good luck. In March of 2013, I went into my university mailbox. I opened it and nearly fell down. The Department of Education said that there were grounds to investigate our case. And it was front page New York Times news a few weeks later. And when that happened, students from all over the country started reaching out. They said, your experience is my experience. What you went through, I went through, and I've never told anyone. And so we had this huge groundswell of student activism and support. And so that's when EROC, um, or Andrew Ape on Campus, came about, because we needed some way to organize hundreds of phone calls of people who have never been heard or listened to. So that, that's the first part of the story. And then the second part, as we're working you know, with these students, we were very careful in terms of framing, saying this is not about one individual. This is not about one school, one institution.